first words in a poem penned by that most famous of fellow leaders, Lord Byron. And he was reflecting on the Greek War of Independence. And the first uh, few lines of that immortal poem read as follows. Fair Greece, sad relic of departed worth, immortal though no more, though fallen great. Who now shall lead thy scattered children forth and long accustomed to bondage uncreate? But it is an equally apt description for the state of the campaign for the return of the Parthenon sculptures. This time, the children are the Phidian forms in the British Museum, whose bondage we must now all uncreate. Uh, by way of uh, personal background, I first glanced on the Parthenon just under 40 years ago. And I can identify precisely why I did, because tomorrow is the 40th anniversary of the student uprising in the Polytechnio in Athens, which was a, uh, a seminal event in modern Greek history. And I well remember visiting the Parthenon just a few weeks after that event. Um, and I was just um, firstly dismayed about the state of Greece at the time, but overwhelmed by being, and again, I apologize for borrowing from uh, romantic poets, I was in the midst of a marbled immortality. And that's something that I can see resonates with all the speakers from um, Emmanuel Pomino and his passionate crusade, Michael Repus, um, Anna Maragu, who I only met yesterday, but we could have written this paper together because a lot of it resonates with what Anna has said. And finally, and again, I apologize for the reverting to poetry, um, I didn't get to see the British Museum until 2000. And it's funny, that recalls what one traveler once said, and that was, in order to properly understand the Parthenon, you have to stop off in London on the way. Now, it shouldn't be like that. But John Keats, uh, the fragile romantic poet in 1816, on seeing the Belgian marbles, as they were then called, and as Emmanuel has correctly pointed out, is incorrect, and as that young student that we've just heard that letter from uh, pointed out, uh, using the name of the looter to somehow take over ownership of, of these incredible sculptural uh, elements, was awestruck in what he saw, uh, couldn't come to terms with the dim conceived glories of the brain, um, re referred to the Grecian grandeur and the certain magnitude projected by the sculptures, and was driven in that most famous of poems on, in an ode, ode on a Grecian urn, what men or gods are these? And you've seen the photos, and I, again I apologize in advance that after Russell's most eloquent and technically savvy presentation, I have no technical background. I'm just going to call a spade a spade about how the campaign has come to this and what we should be doing. But by way of background, and Anna touched on this, uh, the British Museum has effectively rewritten history or has attempted to rewrite history. Um, from use of words such as acquisition, which sounds so neutral, so benign. Um, one of the first um, books on the British, by the British Museum called uh, The Elgin Marbles by B.F. Cook, uh, a famous curator, actually talked about Elgin's men walking around literally picking up pieces as though it was a innocuous activity incidental to their other functions. We know exactly what they did and the previous speakers have elaborated on that. Um, Ian Jenkins, who is a very famous curator and one of the most stalwart defenders of the uh, marbles in the British Museum, uh, describes it, and, and I'm referring to this so that you can understand the British Museum mindset. Because unfortunately I don't think the Greeks have, or when I say the Greeks, the Greek museum establishment, the government, the people who matter need to understand who they're engaging. Um, he referred to it in his uh, work, Archaeologists and Aesthetes in the Sculpture Galleries of the British Museum, as arguably the single most important event in the history of the British Museum. And he actually speaks of the marble's rites of passage from being transformed from an architectural ornament into a museum art object. Now, it doesn't end there because the current director, Neil McGregor, has taken that a lot further. 
Uh, he was here a couple of years ago promoting his book, The History of the World in 100 Objects. Very successful publication. It was part of a BBC production that he presented in which he takes at random 100 objects from the British Museum and effectively continues the mantra that it is a museum where you can see the world under one roof. And everything is reduced to the status of an object. So that when you go to the Duveen Gallery, for example, one of the metos has got a label, I think it's object number 27. It actually is called object number 27 because that's the number he's given it in his book. And he plays down deliberately the significance of the Mediterranean civilization and the influence, the rise of classical Greece, the rise of Athenian democracy, and asks you to go over to the Chinese galleries and compare what was happening under Confucius at the same time. As though to say, well, you don't really need to consider these sculptures in their context in Athens because they're part of a broader world history, so you might as well just see them in, in, in London. And, and that mantra has continued. Um, and, and you heard from Emmanuel before where he says they tell a different story in London. I'll come back to that because he's quite direct. They belong, they now are part of British history. They're, they're as, as blunt and as uh, uh, audacious as to contend that they now belong to Britain. Uh, given that we're talking about an issue between the Greeks and the British in an Australian university, it's appropriate to recall what the great Australian author Donald Horne once wrote in his book, The Great Museum. He talked about the new European desire to order the universe um, and, as, and that desire saw the evolution of museums stopped with the loot of empire. And he describes the British Museum as simply transforming objects into monuments and thereby affirming the legitimacy of imperial domination. And that theme continues where you see the British Museum in various publications uh, on their website, as you saw earlier, describing itself as an instrument of memory, the collective memory of mankind, and I, I respectfully submit that's all because of one issue. They are so dead scared of the Parthenon marbles issue uh, and, and the thought of having to repatriate them that they have reinvented themselves as the Enlightenment Museum, as the Universal Museum, and that that is the main reason why they, you can't justify the return. But let me now come to the essence of my paper, and that is what is, a, what, what is all this fuss about UNESCO? Um, we heard uh, briefly from Anna about Melina McCurry, um, and it's fair to say that she did raise the banner, she did serve it up to the British, but also significantly, in 1983, in, uh, she announced at UNESCO that the Greek government has charged me with the duty of announcing to you here that Greece, through the mediation of UNESCO's Intergovernmental Committee, for the promotion of the return of cultural property to its country of origin, using formal procedures and relying also on legislation currently in force in England, is about to make an official request for the return of the Acropolis marbles. That's 30 years ago. <coughs> I'll return to the uh, committee shortly. Uh, that, was, that request was formally made in October 1983 and was rejected the following year. No real reasons were given. In his history of the British Museum, Sir David Wilson, if you recall from one of the images that Anna showed of Melina McCurry huddling and talking to someone, that was Sir David Wilson, who effectively tried to label her a fascist in wanting to return the old marbles. He wrote this, after Melina McCurry left office, the demands became less vociferous and ultimately died down. This is a book written in 2002 celebrating the, 200th anniversary, uh, the sorry, 150th anniversary of the museum now occasionally bursting into life for a few days as one side or the other thinks up a new argument or puts a foot wrong. Unfortunately, the above passage from Wilson's polemic still rings true today. The campaign reaches a few highs and then falls silent. And from what I've seen and heard today, I'm fortified by the fact that with social media that was so eloquently demonstrated by Russell, uh, through the commitment of Dennis and the supporters here, we can bring that campaign to another level. But that will be all for naught 
if the Greek government doesn't also take the opportunity to directly engage the British. And by that I mean not just making the same um, uh, uh, sounds, we want them back, uh, sending the occasional letter, having the, well, I don't think they've even had any real formal meetings, apart from when uh, Minister Venizelos saw the trustees back in around 2002, but bringing it as a matter of direct bilateral relationships between the British and the Greeks. Um, and, and, and of course, the Greeks could be forgiven for thinking that once the New Acropolis Museum was finally built, and that in itself was a torturous process, as many of you would recall, but when it was finally built, a lot of people, I think, felt compelled, were complacent thinking, well, now we've got the new museum, there's no more excuse. Of course, the British weren't sitting idly. The museum was reinventing itself because in March 1991, the same B.F. Cook that I referred to earlier had sent a memo to the, British, the director of the British Museum, and this is very telling. The next phase of the campaign for repatriation is likely to begin any time after the actual start of construction of the New Acropolis Museum. The problem has not gone away. It is merely in hibernation. And when it wakes up, our successors will find that it is fiercer than before. So the English, the British have known all along that once the New Acropolis Museum is built, the ability to resist calls for return would be harder. But they haven't stood still. With great, great regret, I think the Greeks have. And hopefully, if something can emerge from symposia such as today, is that it's important to directly engage the British and not just skirt around the edges. I mentioned the committee. What is this committee? Uh, in the current cultural um, uh, uh, climate warming debate, uh, you've probably heard of the Intergovernmental Committee on Climate Warming. UNESCO has a number of intergovernmental committees. This one was formed back in 1978. And its charter was to bring together um, parties that have disputes over cultural property. Um, they had a meeting in 1981, appropriately called Lost Heritage in London. And at that uh, uh, symposium, the same David Wilson, uh, made the claim that the British Museum was founded as a universal museum. However, he went on to say he saw no reason why the museum could not lend objects on long-term loans. Now, you heard from Anna before that obviously the idea of exchanging um, uh, artefacts by way of long-term loans uh, is something that's been put on the table. As far back as uh, 1981, the British were amenable to that. But their position has in fact hardened. Over the, over the years. Um, we got to 1983 where Melina McCurry came out, as I mentioned before, and uh, after her unfortunate passing, uh, there's been a revolving door of culture ministers in Greece. Now, that happens in all governments, I can understand that, but I think by last reckoning, since Melina McCurry passed away, I think there have been at least 15 or 16 culture ministers. Um, and uh, my personal wish is that this issue be elevated so that, say, a foreign minister is able to, when he meets with his English counterpart, take it on face to face. But that, that's just my wish. Um, the first... Um, I, I now skip to 1996. You, you've had a number of meetings in that intervening period after Melinda McCurry passed away, but nothing much really happened until 1996 when there was a... Uh, this committee meets probably every two, usually every two years, and Greece um, put on the table a, uh, rec a request for the return. And the, the Director General... Uh, sorry, the committee adopted a recommendation for the Director General of UNESCO to continue his good offices to resolve this issue and to undertake, as a matter of priority, further discussions with both states. Uh, and at that meeting, the United uh, Kingdom uh, representative, and, and it's important to note that at these meetings of UNESCO, the British Museum always has a representative. As I told Anna earlier today, the British Museum is literally embedded in the Department of Culture in, in London. Um, 
he said he, he came up with one of the stock standard excuses, which you will hear time and time again, and most of you are really familiar with that. The British Museum is independent of the government, and that its enabling statute, namely the British Museum Act, limited the circumstances in which it may dispose of any object in its collection. And that's something that recurs all along. In July 1999, there were rumours that the British Museum would be prepared to countenance a proposal that would see the then proposed new Acropolis Museum act as a kind of satellite branch of the British Museum. Um, immediately a spokesperson for the British Museum came out and said, no official approach has been made, recording this is 1999, but if it is, it will be rejected. So it's not a case of, let's talk about it, let's see what the merits are, out of the question. Our position is unchanged. The sculptures are the property of the British Museum. They will not be returning. In 2000, and this is, uh, Amanda may recall this, this is when the uh, Australian committees uh, put submissions into a House of Commons Select Committee under the chairmanship of uh, Gerard uh, Kaufman, with investigating illicit trade into the cultural, into cultural property. The Elgin Marbles, as the British call them there, were, was but I put it this way, the elephant in the room. Clearly, that was the main issue. The report ultimately made no reference to the Elgin Marbles. Uh, you had the then Foreign Minister of Greece, George Papandreou, actually went to uh, London and eloquently addressed the uh, committee. Um, this is the submit part of the submission from the British Museum. The sculptures from the Parthenon now in the British Museum have been in London longer than the modern state of Greece has been in existence. And you've heard that that's reproduced now on the website. As a result, they have become part of this country's heritage and have acted as a focus for Western European culture and civilization. Their colonial arrogance, their imperial condescension knows no bounds. Um, but even then, in, in being questioned by the committee, the then director of the British Museum, Dr. Robert Anderson, again discussed the possibility and considered that uh, about exchanging um, uh, uh, artifacts online and said, where two countries have two halves of two individual objects, there is the possibility for a long-term loan between them. There does seem to me to be something sensible. Well, of course, they've again resolved from that position. Um, as an aside, and, and I do regret not having an image to demonstrate this, um, a few years ago it was discovered that there was a little Sumerian statuette, probably that size. The head, if I recall correctly, was in the Metropolitan Museum of New York. The body was in the Louvre. And for years they'd been having discussions about who had obtained what illegally, illicitly. In the end, after uh, mediation, they came up with a compromise. The two parts would be reassembled and they'd be displayed in each museum four years at a time. So you can have a sensible resolution if you apply good faith and common sense. Uh, my submission is that the British Museum is incapable of both because of their mindset. Um, I can repeat things that have been said over the years. In fact, I'm carrying with me copies of letters that have been sent to the Australian Association, to some of our um, uh, 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 some of our, uh, at least one Premier, Bob Carr, the former Foreign Minister, who had written on behalf of the Greeks asking for return, and the same excuses are given. But it's telling to note that uh, when uh, the then Culture Minister, now Deputy Prime Minister of Greece, Evangelos Venizelos, met Neil McGregor, the current Executive uh, uh, Director, and the Chairman of Trustees, Sir John Boyd, in 2002, at that time, there were again rumours that there were a flurry of meetings going on and that there was about to be a, an agreement brokered for the return of the marbles. On the 14th of November uh, 2002, Sir John Boyd wrote to Venizelos and confirmed that the British Museum trustees remained of the view that the sculptures could not be lent out to the new museum in Athens for a temporary period or at all. Then he went on to state rather patronisingly in my view, let me rehearse again the basis for our belief that the British Museum is the best possible place for these wonderful achievements to be on display. As an essential chapter 
within the worldwide story of human cultural achievement. It is precisely this story which the museum exists to tell through the rich and multifaceted character of its worldwide collections. The British Museum is in denial, but they, and as was so properly demonstrated by Anna Marangu earlier, the, and, and other speakers, the Parthenon is a unique monument. One uh, writer referred to it as the monument of all monuments. And these sculptures are integral to it. Mind you, the Greeks are not after, for example, the Kariatissa, which is in the British Museum, because that's part of another building on the Acropolis, the Erechtheum. They're not after the base or the capital drum that the British uh, have taken, because they've had to replace those with um, other copies to, in the context of the uh, restoration of the uh, broken monuments of the Parthenon. All they're asking for is return of those parts that are integral to the monument. And of course the British won't uh, concede to that. Um, and, and in that letter from Sir John Boyd, he concluded, um, he, he said this, the British do not want the Greeks to be left with the impression that any negotiation issue is underway, bluntly stating, I am bound in all frankness to repeat that I cannot envisage the circumstances under which the trustees would regard it as being in the museum's interest or consistent with its duty to endorse a loan, permanent or temporary, of the Parthenon sculptures in its, in its collections. We then move forward to December 2002. A reference has been made to the declaration of the importance of universal museums. That was where you had a number of the world's leading museums, the Hermitage, Louvre, the Met, got together and uh, made up a declaration, which was indeed, as others have commented, self-serving, uh, about the desirability of recognising the importance of universal museums. It was uh, McGregor, who was the one who was behind this, admitted that there was grave alarm at the way Greece was applying political pressure over the marbles, and the idea that one Western country could build a museum to house objects belonging to another. So there's a reference to the New Acropolis Museum, how dare the Greeks build a museum where they would like to reclaim the artefacts that once belonged to the Parthenon? Um, as we go move forward into the last decade, those issues reoccur. Uh, those of you who have met Professor Dimitris Pandamalis, who is the head of the New Acropolis Museum, would agree, eminent archaeologist, fantastic museum director, was able to chart a very difficult course for the construction of the New Acropolis Museum. He's had an uh, opportunity to meet with McGregor. Um, according to a British Museum spokesperson, we had a, they had a meeting in March 2003. They said the channels of the communication are open, and whilst the British Museum had refused Greece's request for a permanent loan of the sculptures, the museum wanted to find a constructive way of moving forward. That sounds positive. McGregor then gives an interview and says this, Half the marbles are lost forever. They can't get them back up on the Parthenon because it's a ruin. Now, again, those of you who have been privileged to see the Parthenon, there is beauty in that ruin. It's not a ruin in the traditional sense of a derelict house or an abandoned building. But he's reduced it to a ruin. So, that, so the argument that one normally makes for gathering things together from the same ensemble that you're restoring and recovering the work of art does not apply here. One's got to recognise that their life as part of the Parthenon is over. So Mr McGregor has decided that they no longer have any connection, real, virtual, whatever, with the uh, Parthenon. It seems to me rather a fortunate accident of history that about half of what survived is in London. And to reinforce that point, in June 2003, he made this public utterance. I would argue that the life of these objects as part of the story of the Parthenon is over. They can't go back to Parthenon. They are part, now part of another story. At about this time, there were suggestions that UNESCO could take a more prominent role. And in August 2003, a story circulated, and this is as the 2004 Olympic Games were approaching, those of you who would remember those games would know that the Greeks were very confident, or very hopeful I should say, that as part of the 
great spirit that was engendered by holding the games, the British would make some kind of um, repatriation. Of course, nothing came of that. But significantly, the Intergovernmental Committee came up and uh, it was stated, UNESCO has been seeking to encourage a dialogue between the two countries. Uh, Guido Carducci of UNESCO's Division of Cultural Heritage said, the dialogue is focused on whether or not the marbles may be exhibited in Athens. Again, probably through a line, but at least they're trying a dialogue, uh, try, trying some kind of dialogue. No sooner had he said that, and this is a pact that repeats itself repeatedly, sorry, I think that's tautology, but <laughs> repeatedly, something is said, or something is attributed, British Museum Public Relations Machine springs into action and says, no, that's not the case. The trustees cannot envisage any circumstances under which they could accede to the Greek government's request for the permanent removal of sculptures from London to Athens. That goes on and again. I won't bore you with those similar statements. Just take it from me. That um, rehearsed response, whether it's from the British government that says, nothing to do with us, the museum is independent of us, and under the ITS Act, they can't deaccession these items. Now, in the meantime, you would be aware that, uh, and again, it was alluded to before, uh, indigenous remains, oh, no, I talked too long, sorry. Uh, indigenous remains, particularly in Australia, Aboriginal remains, have been repatriated. How did they get them out of the British Museum? They didn't amend the British Museum Act. They introduced an entirely new act called the Human Tissues Act, so they could avoid the, the stigma, the perceived stigma of amending the British Museum Act. The same with Nazi spoliation claims, that is, artworks stolen by or on behalf of Nazis during World War II. The British, and indeed, unfortunately, a lot of museums and, and defenders of the so-called Universal Museum draw a line between booty, namely Nazi spoliation, bones, indigenous remains, and stones. Everything else is okay, but stones have to remain. Um, wrapping up, we now can move forward. Um, in May 2007, one of the Greek delegations to UNESCO, and who is now on the Hellenic Advisory Committee that's advising the Greek government about this, uh, told me that the gap of misunderstandings between the Greek and British side is closing up and that the parties were for the first time closer to the target, however, without any guarantees for final success. And uh, that particular member, I won't identify her, indicated that um, the approach and completion of the New Acropolis Museum would exert pressure on the British Museum. It did nothing of the sort. That was in 2007. With respect, nothing's changed. We move now to the proposal, and I am wrapping up, Dennis. We now move to the proposal uh, that has been in the press. The new culture minister, Panos Paniotopoulos, has taken the initiative, and all credit to him and the Greek government. They've, it's in the past that the British have said, oh, we're prepared to talk. The UNESCO committee has encouraged bilateral discussions. So that they issued a formal request through UNESCO to have what's called mediation. Now, mediation is basically having a, a mediator or a facilitator or a group of a number of people bringing the parties together, holding constructive talks, um, and there are rules and procedures that have been set out. One of the basic tenets, and the lawyers in this room would know that, is that you have to approach a mediation in good faith. If, if it's to succeed at all, it's not only voluntary, but you approach it in good faith. So when I wrote the title to my paper, Why Cultural Diplomacy will not work. Um, I, as I said at the beginning of this paper, I leave it to you, in light of the brief history that I've given to you, whether um, cultural diplomacy, in this case uh, uh, mediation through UNESCO, will work. I hope it does. I have my doubts. And in conclusion, I, I, I would like to say this: more than 30 years, it's, and so more than 30 years, when Melinda McCurry elevated the issue of the Pantheon sculptures on the world stage. Cultural diplomacy, whether through the auspices of UNESCO or by means of both direct bilateral negotiations, negotiations, has yet to yield real fruit. The Parthenon sculptures are a part of our dream and memory and spiritual landscape. As that great American writer, and we have some American friends here today, Henry Miller so famously put it, Athens represents the pure distilled heritage of a past which is not altogether lost.
the Parthenon is at the core of that heritage. And, and my final point is, again, I apologise for referring to, reverting to poetry, um, but those of you who are aware, familiar with Yanis Vitsos, Taliana Trawala, the 18 short songs of a bit of motherland, the one message I have for the Greek, British Museum is, and I'll say it in Greek and then I'll translate it roughly into English, Edotophos, Se tuta edota marmara, kakia skuriad en piani, mi de alisida stu romiu, Upon these white marbles, no ugly rust will stain, neither can a Greek nor the wild wind be chained. So, as Mandel said, until the last, I draw my last breath, we'll, I will continue, we will continue to fight for the return, we won't be chained down, and eventually, one day, perhaps our children or our grandchildren will see their return. Thank you very much.